Hi, this is Paul at Focus Pulling. When grids of lights started showing up on affordable LED panels a few years ago, I figured that's what I'd be using for everything. And I even bought one of those crazy fold-up panels when they hit the market. You might have seen a guest review posted here showing some really small lights that can do the job too. But with this new Sokani X60 RGB product, I think I'm ready to move into the world of more theatrical Fresnel lighting. And this video will show you how to pull together the most cost-effective kit on the market, including a stand, a diffuser, and a bag for everything. This Sokani light is an expansion of their X60 product into a full-color RGB, and it comes with a reflector that magnifies the output from its LED elements. They've added a glass protector that you can see screwed down over the light-emitting diodes, since these often get roughed around and the elements are fragile. It outputs 6,820 lux at one meter with the reflector on, which is a lot lower than its new close competitor, the Aperture Amaron 200X with 42,300 lux at indoor color temperature. But this is an RGB light that trades off lux for the full range of color. And I rarely turn up the output past 50% anyway. The Aperture costs one and a half times more too. Another thing that Sakani added to their lineup with their version 2 X60 is a more secure mounting bracket. If you look closely, you'll see airy rosette-like teeth that prevent the housing from pivoting down when you're loading it with weight up front, like the diffuser you'll see in a minute. The mounting bracket attaches to any standard light pole with sockets for both horizontal and vertical positions. For powering up, you also get an AC adapter that plugs into the bottom of the light but that side of the cabling is really short, so it can't reach the ground. For now, I've just set the power brick on top of the light, and its cables hold it in place. But I'll need to use a clamp in the field, and I wish they made the cable longer on the delivery side, since it's much easier to extend an AC cable. Sakani does sell an optional battery sled that takes two Sony L-Series batteries, and it has a C-clamp so you can just fix it onto your light stand pole. It has a few more ports to power other accessory devices too. The back panel control display is bright enough for daytime and it shows you everything you need. At the end of this video, I'll do a deep dive through every feature, showing you smartphone control on the same screen too. Everything packs into an included carrying case with good padding. Since portability and low cost is what distinguishes this $200 product, I found a match in the perfect lighting stand for it, manufactured by Impact and sold for as little as 100 bucks. Its best feature is that it combines light stand and boom, with a mounting hole at the top so you can attach a counterweight. Impact includes a saddlebag that you can throw anything into for adding weight, like other batteries you brought with you or bottles of water that you'd be drinking when you pack up anyway. The stand has a big knob to tighten the angle that doesn't slip, and its magic trick is that the boom arm telescopes down into the vertical light stand. So you can skip the boom part if you don't need it, and then the stand adapter at the end can just point straight up. It's reasonably small at 45 inches collapsed, but it can get up to 13 feet. For packing everything up but keeping to a low budget, there's also a great padded bag that fits the stand perfectly from Rugard costing under 40 bucks, and that's way below anything else I could find. It's perfect for holding the light stand and also the diffuser that we're adding to this kit. For that, a light like this almost always has a standard so-called Bowen mount, and it's just one latch as you see here, with three sort of teeth that you insert and twist in to lock. What I've hooked on here is the Aperture Lantern. At under 90 bucks, it's the perfect pairing with this light. Acting like a so-called china ball or paper lantern, it provides very soft light with wide diffusion, and it's often used overhead, which makes that combo boom stand come in handy. My favorite feature is how it instantly sets up and breaks down. You just latch one center support loop into a hook that you can see here peeking down into the bottom. And those pre-installed ribs on the side just sort of warp into position. It literally takes about five seconds. And when it's collapsed, it's nice and small, so we can fit it into that same impact bag, even though it comes with its own too. 
You can see more uses of the light in Aperture's own advertising video, often overhead and often using black skirts that are also included to narrow down the light radius if you need to. But you can still mount it facing forward like a typical softbox for interviews too. So now that we've gone through all the ingredients, let's learn how this thing actually works by overlaying a smartphone view that's directly connected to the product. It's first asking me about location access, which sounds scary, but Bluetooth actually requires it. And what I've done here is I've tapped to scan for already connected devices, but there weren't any yet. So what I need to do is I need to add a device and it's already found the active Bluetooth signal of the turned on product that you see on your screen. So now that it's activated, I'm tapping the device itself and it's sort of entering the device for control. At the very top of the screen, you can see how you can actually apply settings to only the current device that you selected or to actually everything. But I'm going to tuck that down a little bit because you can see a white card that I've put on the brick wall for a, a little bit better reference. And I've just raised the intensity. Of course, everything's relative when we're shooting like this. So what looks like 100, you know, is uh, blown out because of the fact that I'm exposing for um, the back panel. But what you can see here is we're in CCT mode, and that basically is the traditional, is it daylight or is it indoors or anything in between sort of question. And so you can see it limits to that in regards to color temperature rather than monkeying around with hue, except that it does, right? It lets you tweak hue just a little bit when it comes to green and magenta compensation, but very, very hard to see unless you're really looking at that white card. So that's the CCT mode. But when we go to the next mode of full RGB control, then we can see how, yes, you do have the intensity control for how bright it is. But as I move around the color wheel, you can see the dot there. You can see how the farther out I go to the edge, the more saturated it is. I like to call that, what's the volume control on total color? Um, so that's on the outer rim and you can see the whole range. Now, as I move back into the circle, you can see there's a saturation indicator showing how much in that little box on the right. And so it's just a fainter color, but still in the direction um, wherever I'm going. So that was that mode. And proceeding next to a more granular mode of individually controlling red, green, and blue, this is uh, something that is more, I believe, a sort of numbers-based and more, how do I say, analytical, scopes-based type of interface that I frankly don't use as much as the other two. And again, for most purposes, for a typical film shoot, you're probably going to stay in that CCT mode because usually things come down to how much uh, white balance or achieving white balance, right? With what the color temperature should be and a slight adjustment to tint. Um, but here you have that really granular control in each separate category. And then after this less pragmatic category of control, we get to the ultimately least useful for most people. I've noticed that pretty much all lights from the highbrow to the lowbrow always have this effects mode. And special effects meaning that for theatrical, dramatic type things, on that rare instance when I guess you'd need to run and gun these um, using presets, it vaguely simulates things like sirens and fire and um, strobing effects, which can be kind of useful. I haven't adjusted them here for you, but you can see how you can adjust the frequency and the intensity of the overall effect. Um, they have things like just simply automatically rotating around the color wheel. Um, and then they have some more mysterious labels like paparazzi coming next. And I frankly have no idea why that is meant to trigger the notion of paparazzi when we see it in action. But hey, it's not like they uh, charged you more for their FX feature, right? So I'm wrapping up here with another run through the intensity slider, just to sort of emphasize the point that even though I'm exposing here, of course, for the very dark back panel, so this looks very severe, the range gets up there and you might end up dwelling mostly around 50% or less. 
um, but it does have that extra kick up to 100 and when you put it behind a diffuser as you've seen in this video it's really giving you a fantastically soft light that's already much more powerful than we were getting with conventional LED panels of yore. So I hope this was useful for suggesting a complete solution from top to bottom to build a light kit. And if you may, like and subscribe, and you can read the full blog post at the link below.